Friends, welcome to Liberty Blue, the essential New York Rangers podcast. I'm Andrew Chelney, alongside Nick Zararis and Nick, a flawless three in a week. They won against the Flyers, the Avs, and a wild one for some reason against Arizona. They are 50, 20, and 4. 104 points are the best team in the league right now, and we're in the home stretch of the regular season. The Arizona game and the Philly game were both weird. Uh, th- there's no other way to describe it. The Philly game was two nothing for 35 of the 50 the 60 minutes of the game and then nobody decided to play defense the entire third period similar vibe in arizona where it was tied for a while there and then nobody started to play defense there were rush opportunities going both ways and then colorado they played to a push and you beat colorado in the shootout you feel good about that colorado is one of if not the best teams in the entire league if you can hang around with them and yeah colorado controlled large stretches of play they're gonna do that they're better their star players are better than the Rangers star players, but the Rangers were able to hold on. Shesterkin was great. And that was the difference at this point in the season. It's about reacclimating Lindgren and Truba, which it does seem like we're going back to Truba Miller full time based on what lobby said. Other than that, you know, stay healthy. You want to get as good a seat as you possibly can. If things work out and you get to play Washington, you get to play Philly or the Islanders in round one, that's a really good draw for you. So if you can avoid playing someone good until the second round, that's really all you got to worry about right now. I I really wish Laviola would break up Truman Miller. I I, we talked about this, you know, the ad nauseum. We've talked about this with Sam, with Molly, us. We've talked about this for the better part of two seasons. I really wish they would not do this, but they keep doing this. So that's uh, at this uh, point, it's like asking for Gaudreau to come out of the lineup. It's not happening, so there's no point in talking about it. It's just frustrating. But it it's again what like this week highlights what we talked about last week, where the Rangers are comfortable winning regardless of the situation that presents itself. They played a a, a, a a good game against Colorado. Yeah, the Shesterkin needed to bail him out a couple of times, but for the most part, like that was a, a like you said, a push. They played that game tight. It was you know they won the shootout shootouts. You could you could take it or leave it, but regular season, that's that's how games are are ended if no one scores in overtime. So that's you know it is what it is. But like thought like the Flyers game was crazy. Like th- that game was that game was a whole lot of normalcy and then they get to the third period and all of that just flew out the window it's like oh we have two okay so you got the two periods of of normal hockey now we're gonna turn the sliders up and nhl 24 all the way down or all the way up depending on what or what kind of chaos you want and go that's that was the third period it was insanity nobody played defense nobody saved a puck either it was all just like hey what first one to 15 wins the game like that that was what the third period felt like Rangers won. Adam Fox, great, you know, great goal in overtime. Panarin did a lot of the dirty work to have to play. If the Flyers had a goaltender, maybe they win that game. But maybe if they maybe if they had a goalie, the Rangers would play that a little bit differently. I don't know. Either, like we're just players at that point. Arizona, I couldn't tell you what happened because the Rangers like dom- the Rangers dominated the whole game pretty much, except for the times that they didn't, and every time that they didn't, the puck ended up in the net. Like it was, it was a strange game from the perspective of like, the Rangers never, f- like they never felt like they were going to lose that game. They they were in charge for the vast majority of the, of the sixty minutes. Like they 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 played the game in such a way that exuded the confidence of oh like we're like we're winning like don't whatever Arizona's doing doesn't matter we're going to win this game and ultimately that's what happened giving up five goals. And a lot of and some some of them were just bad defensive breakdowns. I would like to not see that. I would like the Rangers to clean that up. But overall, I mean, listen, they ask you how they ask they ask you how many. They don't ask you how. You were saying? No, that's it. They, they, that's it. Okay. I got you. I got you. <laughs> they ask. They ask you how. They don't. Ask, I mean, they they don't ask you how. They ask you how many. That's it. At the end of the day, yeah. At this point in the season, you got a handful of games to go. Most of your games are getting are against teams that aren't in playoff spots right now. 
I will not be surprised if we see spot sits, especially if teams get in front of them as far as division um, points and standings. But you got to get Truba and Lingren back up to speed. You know, Lingren's played two games. Truba's played one. Uh, the Arizona game devolved because they realized if they just trade chances with Arizona, they're more talented. And that's not a, a great mindset to get into of we can outscore our defensive issues. So it doesn't matter how we play defense. I know that in conversations I've had with quite a few people that, that that's the real concern about this group, the forward talent it's there. This is one of the deeper, if not the most deep Rangers forward groups we've had in 10, 15 years, probably since Tortorella has been, was the coach named coach. This is one of the deepest forward groups, if not the single deepest, and the defense on paper is very talented, but it needs to play like it. And there are holes in the defense. And if we are going to see a return to Fox Lindgren and Truba Miller, that is going to put a lot of the responsibility for how this team's future shakes out on those two pairs. Because frankly, that is, old. That is, in my opinion, the biggest swing for this Rangers team. Because I think the forward talent, I have a pretty good idea and understanding of what it is in all range of outcomes. The defense is just, it is so unpredictable in, on a night-to-night basis. I mean, how do you give up five goals to the Flyers and go to overtime and then go to a shootout against the Avalanche where you only concede one? You know, it's it's really weird when you have a game like that on consecutive days. And then the next game you go out there against Arizona and you concede five. It's, it's really weird. And yeah, I know they were reintegrating Truba on Saturday. I know they brought Lindgren back in on, on uh, Thursday. So that's part of it. I understand that's part of it, but like we've talked about ad nauseum, I still believe that's the key for this Rangers team to get to where they need to go is if the defense can actively be good at defense help facilitate the transition to offense, which they have done pretty well during stretches of the season, then we're talking about a team that can go all the way. If they are as frantic, as scattered, as disorganized as they've been in some of these games, then you have real cause for concern. But until they play the games, you won't know because this group is extremely unpredictable. I do feel like... Because they've shown that they essentially, and even though this could be a hazard, they could essentially turn it on whenever they want in terms of actually playing defense in games. I feel like once the playoffs begin, we'll see more. I mean, it won't ever be perfect, but I I would have to imagine that we'll be seeing more of the Colorado-type defense as opposed to Philadelphia or whatever we saw in Arizona because like they know uh, they know better than we do that you know they're top of the and like they're top of the standings like yes obviously you want to play a top of your game every game no matter what and you play to your strengths etc cetera, etc cetera. they're also you know they're they're not numbers on a on a on a piece of paper they understand that hey we're the best team in the league we're playing an Arizona team that is not great and we can just dismantle them whenever we want. So if we concede an extra goal and score an extra three because we can and because we're having fun, like that's what that's what they're choosing to do right now. But I feel like once we get into the playoffs, we'll see a lot more of the stingent defense that the Rangers have shown that they can play against the best teams in the league. They have, I think, a 13-8-1 record from my, uh, from my notes against the top 10 teams in the league. Obviously, they can't play themselves. So the top nine teams in the league... They're 13-8-1. That doesn't come from playing loose defense. That comes from playing a, a, certain, a certain style of hockey that dictates the pace of the game and that dictates giving up as few, as few chances as possible. So while it's not the best to see them giving up five goals against a team that isn't anywhere close to making the playoffs and uh, essentially a, a race to see who, who gets the 10 first, I, it, because of what we've seen from them against the better teams in the league, it it gives me a little bit of hope that it'll be cleaned up once we drop the puck for game one. My counterpoint to that is Laviolette does seem pretty determined to try and make Barkley Goudreau's line a defense line, even though it is not good at it. You know, I, I, I they tried that the first time they played Colorado in February. And I want to say in the first period of that game, if I remember Peter, 
Peter Blas of the Athletics article correctly, the McKinnon line had 97% of the expected goals in the first period against Gaudreau VZ. And I don't remember who the other wing was with them because that was when the forwards were all kind of jacked up because injuries and stuff. But, and again, he tried the same thing on Thursday. My, my concern with that type of mindset, and he didn't do it the entire time. Zbigniew Kreider, Roslovic got some shifts against McKinnon, but to I think that is where my main my main concern about things that are controllable. You know, if you get outplayed, you get outplayed. That's not something you can control. But if the coach is going to make certain matchup decisions based on his perception of things of, all right, I want Gaudreau, VZ, and whomever out there against McKinnon. I, Fox and Lindgren had a really rough time in that game against Mc, uh, McKinnon and Ranton. McKinnon and Ranton are two of the 10 best players in the entire world, I understand, and they didn't score. You know, they held McKinnon off of the score sheet for the first time in a home game all season, which is something to feel reasonably good about. But that's the type of game where – if you reduce it to just a handful of sequences, you're going to take Colorado's guys. And that's the concern I have when they try and play that type of game. You know, that's what the Tampa Bay game three weeks ago was on the Thursday. It was that type of game. And then Tampa Bay star players blew the game open. We've also seen the other end of that where they've played Florida reasonably well in the last few weeks. Colorado is no slouch. So I think my big concern is, can we find that next gear? You know, they've played reasonably well in a bunch of different types of games. That's something we highlighted last week, that they've won high scoring, low scoring. They've won with goaltending. They've won with the power play. Can we find a middle ground where we're not only getting, we're not only relying on one path to victory because series to, game to game within a series, it's hard when you're up and down like that. To go through the playoffs and to go on a deep run, you need to have a certain baseline you're operating at. And the Rangers' baseline this year is great. I mean, we we still have our reservations about how Zabinijad has played this year, and they have the best record in the entire league, which says a lot about this group and the potential it has. But that's the thing, man. Good doesn't win the Stanley Cup. I think the the one counter that I'll say to your counter is the for the for the Goudreau stuff is Peter Laviolette has shown that if something isn't work, I mean, for the most part, except for Chuba Miller, for the most part, if he's trying things out and they're not working, he's at least okay with with changing it up. He's okay with okay, the Goudreau line against McKinnon is ass and it's not working. Okay, let me try somebody else. At least he's malleable in that sense of. I'm not just going to stick to my guns because I know better than everybody, and damn it, it's going to work because I said so. To a certain extent, he's doing that with the defense pairing, sure, and you know, keeping Zibetajad and Kreider together when they're struggling, et cetera, et cetera. But he has also shown where you know situations like a few weeks ago where Goudreau was just awful against McKinnon, and that took one period for Laviolette to be like, okay, somebody else has to has to do this because they can't. So. While I would like to see more malleability if things aren't working, at least there's a certain baseline. And, yeah. I would, and I would have to imagine that come the playoffs, there's going to be maybe even more of that because, you know, there's only seven games max in a series. And if it, things don't work and things continue to not work, guess what's going to happen? You're going to lose the series. So I, I, I'm a, you know, I, I'm a lit, like, I feel like Laviolette is at the point of his career, and he's done this so many times. I was obviously he won the cup, you know, back in 480p TV, but he won it on the Versus Network. Yeah, he did win it on the Versus Network, but he's been through so many coaching stops. He under he's adapted to the situation that's that's in front of him right now. I do feel like I have at I have at least a baseline confidence that if things aren't working in their current juncture, that Peter Laviolette will at a certain point change things up instead of just throwing the same people out there and expecting different results. I think the reason I have a little more pause about it is because a lot of the Rangers' faults and shortcomings they're tendency based. They're habit based. It's not a structural issue. It's not a talent issue. It's guys making that split second decision where it just doesn't work. You know, I forget what player on the Flyers it was that 
Keandre reached his stick out to try and poke the puck away, and the Flyers player just spun around him completely. Miller swung his stick, and Shesterkin didn't have a single chance to play the puck because Miller waited too long to make a read. It's those split-second decisions. Those are not things that I think – those are not problems that I think are a coach thing. I think a lot of this is going to come down to can these guys – correct on their shortcomings because a lot of these tendencies are just general shortcomings they are holes in these guys games they have refused or failed to adapt to and that's not something i think coaching is going to get out of especially when we're talking about guys who are you know like truba like miller at this point relatively ingrained in a certain way of playing now there, there's no reason they can't. It's just like you said last week when we were when I was talking about reintegrating Truba and to the effect of can they get Truba to make fewer big mistakes and focus more on taking low risk plays, that type of thing. It's going to be hard to make that type of change, which is why I feel a lot of this is going to come down to can they find that gear and stay there? And one last thing before I throw it back to you, I was talking about this with Hunter over the Hunter Hodes over the weekend can the Rangers are have the Rangers gotten their form too early? I do think that is something that I am a touch concerned about that they've gone on this crazy heat, like 20 some 21 and three, 21, one and three heater since the Connor Mackey game now, as opposed to if this started about now, 10 games in. Cause I do think you want to be playing reasonably well going into the playoffs but I don't think you want to peak too early because I do think that happens to teams. I do think teams will have really good regular seasons and feel comfortable. And then they get into round one and they get punched in the mouth. Like Florida two years ago comes to mind. Boston last year comes to mind. Every Leafs team since 2017 comes to mind. So I am a little worried that all of this happening and all of this going right right now might be a little too early. Yes and no. I mean, I, I definitely share a little bit of that sentiment. I also, like, the Rangers' schedule the rest of the way isn't very difficult. No. So that's a double-edged sword of, hey, there's no top 10 team to play against to essentially, quote-unquote, get ready for the playoffs. At the same time, you can use this runway to, one, rest guys, because you're not playing anybody super important. You're not. You can rest guys. You can clean up whatever else you need to clean up, etc. I also think that to, to counter one point that you're saying, the Rangers have these concerns, sure. Every team is saying that about themselves as well. I think, like, you know, the Rangers right now are the best team in the NHL and we're breaking down, okay, these are the good things that they're doing. Also, if they don't fix their faults, they're not going to win anything. Every team that's in a playoff spot right now is saying the same thing. Like, and that like that's the one thing that we have to kind of keep in mind as well. And I'm not trying to you know be like, oh, everything is great, everything is no, fantastic. No, no, no. Like, I understand what you're but saying, but it's I like it's one of those things where you also like you have to look big picture and say, okay, if we just continue to play the for, for the most part the same way that we have been playing against the best teams because we we've beaten. Be- you know the best teams. We've shown that we're the best team in the league, and that we can we can take two. You know we can win these these tight games, these open games. However style you want to play, we can we can play the same way, and we can beat you at your game while we do it. The Rangers have shown that they can do that all season. So uh, yeah, I'm, they obviously have concerns as well, and we've talked about them throughout the season. But every team, I feel like it has the same, if not more, cons- like they're because they're below the Rangers. They have more concerns about their team than than I feel like the Rangers do because the Rangers are the best team in the league right now. This is a regular season versus postseason conversation. I, I think that's been a franchise issue for the Rangers for a long time, where they're a really good regular season team. You know, they're going to hit the hundred. They've hit the hundred points threshold for the third straight season. They've won fifty games, I believe, two of the last three uh, during that run under Elaine Vigneault and John Tortorella. Same boat, hundred plus standings points. Really good regular season team built around goaltending, timely scoring, situational play. I think that's really where the source of my apprehension comes from because when the games tighten up and the other team is fundamentally sound and can't be as um, can't be, won't be as susceptible to trying to open the game up. It really benefits them 
that their most likely first round matchup is either going to be Washington or Philadelphia. Those are two teams where if the Rangers take a stumble at some point in that series, I wouldn't be that worried about it. You know, if they split at home in round one, I wouldn't be that worried about it because Washington is really just Charlie Lindgren and three or four guys. Philadelphia is just three or four forwards and a lot of four checking. Those are things, those are opportunities to get things right. Um, Changing up gears a little bit, one thing I wanted to touch on on this episode, they really, 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 I don't know what they do, how they do it, but the fact that Shesterkin was playing gener- awful, legitimately awful into early February, and now our biggest concern is, well, can the fourth defenseman be a little bit better? Can the 12th forward not just be an albatross? That, I... Th- I- I don't know how, I don't know. Same thing with Jonathan Quick, you know, in, I want to say December, we recorded an episode where Quick had already had like 12 or uh, he already had like six or seven wins in early December. And we said, if he won like three more games the rest of the year, and they got like 15 standings points out of his starts, that was an unequivocal success. They've kept it going. And yeah, the goaltending has been timely. It's rounding into form. He didn't have a great game against Arizona for what it's worth. Yeah. But yes, he, he looked very Jonathan Quick like has one of those has those moments where he makes himself look as tiny as he physically can in nets and in, in, in nets sometimes like so, sometimes he plays normal the way that he has been playing for the most part of this season and then he played games like that against Arizona where he's like all crunched up and he's just not making himself big and he lets the net be bigger than it is and, and listen he's won the vast majority of of the games that he's played that's not like it i love that like fantastic but yeah like that that was that was my one thing about john the quick like against the arizona game i'm just like dude you're can you make yourself any smaller please like you <laughs> yeah. just, he's he's like he's he, the the acrobatic stuff was a little strange. I don't know. It's just it was one of those games for him. He's but, 17 5 and 2 but with overall, a 9 1 3. He's been yeah. Everything Fantastic. you need from a backup. Yeah. Yeah. The Rangers have really, yeah. they haven't exactly got it down to a science. They have missed occasionally on backups. But for the most part, the goaltending being the foundation of a reasonably good regular season team is why they are where they are. Yep. The fact the fact they were able to be where they were in early February, which is Sturkin having a below 900 save and being at like 20th and goal saved above expected, a testament to how much room they had, which is a theme that I, that I think is the undercurrent of this season that they really haven't looked amazing for multiple games in a row. They've won a lot of games, but they're not clean. They're not pretty. And their good players have gone on heaters. Once they, if they can get everything to line up or stagger everything where they get the cold streaks out of link where it's hot guys who are hot and cold together. I think that's the biggest thing the Rangers need. And it's something I was looking through box scores the other day of teams of years past, like 2015, 2014, 2017, 2012 teams that went on deep runs. The issue the Rangers had was that a bulk of the scoring was on the responsibility of two or three guys. I think this group is a little bit deeper than that. I think you can realistically say they have three to four forwards who are candidates to be close to, if not over a point per game in Panarin, Zabinijad, Lafreniere, and Trocek. That's four guys who can flirt with point per game, plus Adam Fox, who should be a point per game. He was the only player who was a point per game in the playoffs in 2022. Formula-wise, that's what you need. You need at least three, if not four, plus a defenseman and the goaltending. The recipe is there. Everything is laid out. It really is going to come down to if the variance gods like you or not. And I I know that's unsatisfying. And I know that's something I've said a lot over the years on this show. The best team does not always win. The Rangers are one of the best teams in the entire league. They get the wrong matchup in the first round. They go to overtime twice and they're looking down the barrel of a game seven. Anything can happen. So it's it's a complicated conversation because I had somebody ask me that the other day, you know, if the Rangers don't win the cup this year, are they fucked? You know, is this their best chance? Is this the last best opportunity they're going to have? 
And I really, it really does kind of feel like that. If it doesn't line up this year, it's going to be at least two to three years before they can go back for it. So they really have to do everything. Everything that is controllable needs to be synced up. There are some things that aren't, you know, the other team can play better. No matter how good the Rangers are, eventually they might run into a team who's just better than them. That's one of the things too, is you take a look at the NBA, for example, and you look at, okay, the the teams that are genuinely capable of winning the the NBA championship are like, like three, three or four teams, <laughs> B- because the NBA is very low on this on the luck based totem pole. Hockey is by default and by design the highest on the totem pole because you can shoot a puck from the blue line; it goes off of an eight knees and 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 four backs, and it goes in the net. And what are you gonna do about that? That's like that's those are shots where you will never be able to replicate if you tried for a hundred thousand times. But the one time you did it in the course of a game, it goes off of six skates, three gloves, one helmet, and it goes in the net like that. That you you don't see that in other sports. So inherently, this is by by design a stupid, silly, fun sport. Like you, you because you can't dictate breaks like that. You just can't over the course of a hockey game, whether it be one series, a season, however much you want your your you know your sample size to be. These kind of wacky moments will happen. And they will happen at random whenever the hockey gods decide that they happen. So there's a there's a, a layer of unpredictability that you will never get rid of in this sport. So the 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 best way to deal with it is to just mitigate it. Because you will never get rid of it fully. You will never be able to control every bounce. Not every bounce will go your way. Sometimes you'll hit six posts and lose a game. Sometimes the other team will have eight shots, but five of them go in because it bounces off of four shins and into the back of the net. Like these are things that are going to happen over the course of a sample size. So the but the best teams they mitigate that the best. Where okay, oh you get three goals by these weird bounces that should never have gotten in. Okay, we'll just score four because we're better, and that's the game. The best teams find a way to, to to stare luck in the face and say, it doesn't matter. We're better than you anyway. Yeah, that's the thing. This group is really interesting in a lot of different ways. You have a lot of guys at various points of their careers. You have a couple guys who were on their way out. You know, you got guys like Quick who accomplished everything they've wanted to and some and just stuck around purely to spite the Kings and to try and trace down Ryan Miller, which he's successfully done. You have a lot of guys on this team who haven't won anything, who have been around the block, guys like Truba, guys like Zabinijad, guys like Kreider, a lot of miles, a lot of playoff games, a lot of heartbreak. You have young guys like Lafreniere, like Kako, like Miller, like Fox, that feel... I do not know what the next iteration of the Rangers looks like in my head. I think that's the biggest reason I feel that this year has to be the year for everything to line up because I struggle to think about what the next iteration of the team looks like. The team that's built around Lafreniere, Miller, Fox, Shesterkin, because there's a lot of unknown beyond those guys. I imagine Zbigniew and Trocek will be here because those contracts are immovable. I imagine Panarin will probably be here because those contracts are immovable. And speaking of Panarin, I, I know this is a tangent off of what I was just saying, but it was it, it came up the other day in conversation, and I thought it was a good point. The reason I feel so strongly about this group, you have three or four guys all having career years lined yeah. up at the same time. That's the type of regular season luck we're talking about that it takes to go all the way. You know, Lafreniere putting it all together, unequivocally part of the reason this feels like the best group. Yes. They He's have been a fantastic. They have fantastic. a fourth guy. I mean, also, this man doesn't get any power play opportunity at, at on the first power play. He doesn't no. he doesn't get he doesn't get PP one time. The fact that he's putting out fifty plus points without getting power play one time is nothing short of a like he's fantastic. Yeah. It's I cannot wait to do a real deep dive after the season, after the playoffs. Cause I I 
my biggest curiosity is what's changed for him, Trocek, and Panarin, other than Panarin shooting the most. I want to get a better understanding. Are they playing off of the rush more or less? Are they generating a certain type of look that's been more dangerous? Because I don't want to chalk up all of Trocek and Lafreniere's success this season to Panarin playing like a Hart Trophy guy, even though that's probably the obvious answer. You know, if you play with a guy who has 100 points, the two guys who play with him are going to put up a lot more points than they have in years past. I know Trocek is pretty close to setting a career high in points. He probably won't get his goals total because he had 31 one year in Florida. But, but that, but the, the thing about that, and I don't mean to cut you off, but the thing, the thing about the points, though, is it's one thing to get points. It's another thing to get meaningful points and also play well on top of the points that you get. Like Lafreniere realistically should have like six or seven more goals than he has. He's yeah. gotten he's hit post, he's gotten unlucky a few times. Like he's played so well that his he's probably getting less points right now than he should be having at this point of the season because he's been playing so well. Yeah, I mean defensively still not amazing. No, that line but, is never going to be good defensively, right, exactly. but and you take ta- that. Right, and we've you talked about that. that. Like, But offensively, he's been nothing short of, like, five-on-five five sensational. And yeah. that's exactly uh, the player that the Rangers have desperately needed for multiple years now. The five-on-five five guy that will say, get out of my way, I will do this myself. And while Lafreniere isn't at that upper, upper, upper echelon of player yet, he's still 22. He's still got years left, you know, to to develop and get get even get, get even better than he is now. He is starting to become that player of. Oh, we're at five on five. Oh, I'm not getting power play one time. Oh, it's fine. I'm just gonna score a goal anyway because it's my time. We're, we need. Oh, we need a goal. All right. Let me let me just go let me just go ahead and score real quick. Like that's the kind of player the Rangers have desperately needed and now they it looks like they have one and that's been a massive revelation for them as well. I think him and I think Miller are the two biggest swing points on this team. I think if the Rangers go on a deep and meaningful playoff run, we're going to see Miller take a real step at some point during the course of that playoff run and really cement himself as the second best defenseman on this team. And I think Lafreniere is going to force his way into a bigger role, whether that's on the power play, whether that's getting that line even more minutes up five on five, which will probably happen. You know, I, I, that's that's another tool that they have that will help them that other teams won't. You know, other than Florida and maybe Toronto, there are a few teams in the entire East that are going to be able to bet out. If the Rangers are in a tie game late and they need a goal, there are few teams who can do better than putting Fox out there with Panarin, Trocek, and Lafreniere. That's a, one of the best fours, and it doesn't even matter who's out there with Fox, whether it's Lindgren, whether it's Gustafson, Zach Jones, whoever. It doesn't even matter. If you have Fox and Panarin on the ice at the same time, That is two of the 20 best players in the entire world, two maybe of the top 10 players in the entire world on the ice at the same time. What I was talking about before with McKinnon and Ranton and and McCarr being able to control the flow of the game so well, the same thing applies there. This is not empty calorie offense for them. Some guys in the lineup, yes, there is empty calorie offense. Those guys, it's not. Panarin is making games happen. He is bringing guys to him. When he gains the zone, he is setting guys up at the net front. He is letting the shots fly and forcing defenses to respect his ability as a shooter, which is in turn given the other guys of this lineup so much more room to operate. And it's why they're so good in overtime in those three on threes. When you put Panarin and Fox out there at the same time, those are two guys who don't have to think about anything. They subconsciously know where the play is going and what needs to be done. And it's why they make it look so easy. Like I saw, I I was at the game on Tuesday against the Flyers and I saw Fox take the stride. And I said, if he hits the net, it's going in because he had a clean look and Urson been pretty mediocre at that point in the game. Guys like that, you don't have to worry about. I, I this is something else that we talked about a lot last summer. Fox did not have a good series against the Devils last year. No. He looked slow. He got out body. He got out physical, and he lost a lot of loose pucks. Whether or not Lingren being physically compromised was part of it, that's a fair. That's a fair point. But that was part of the reason the Rangers did not look good in that series. That Adam Fox, arguably their best non-Shesterkin player, was ineffective. 
So the fact he's put this together, and I don't think he'll get Norris consideration this year. Unfortunately, he might get, he'll get some down ballot votes. He'll probably end up finishing fourth or fifth. But over the last month, he really seems to kind of put it together in a way that's not just the underlying numbers. Just watching him, he looks a lot more aggressive. He's 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 up to what fifteen goals on the season for a defenseman, which is insane. I want to say that's one of the five highest goal totals by a defenseman in the league this year. Him going, Panarin going, Shesterkin going. That's a really strong foundation. Really strong foundation. A hundred percent. And it's not all like the teams very rarely get the opportunity to have one of the best forwards going at at an incredible like Panarin has broken his career high in points and there's still what eight games up in the season nine something like that like he's still got like two weeks left of hockey to play and he's already surpassed his point total. He's been one of the best forwards in the league. Adam Fox is one of the best defen- defensemen in the league. Strickland's one of the best forwards in the league. And now also on top of that, Trocek's having a career career year. Lafreniere's having a career year. Like, and and the 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 depth is the depth is there. Will Cooley's having a really good rookie year. Like there are guys on this team that are performing at or above expectation, and these are the top 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 guys as well as some of the depth pieces that you had question marks going into the year of oh you know will cooley oh okay he made the team oh if we if he can get 10 goals the whole season that's a massive success he's already surpassed that like there's multiple people on this roster that are are exceeding the expectations that were brought to them don't forget brodzinski brodzinski is giving you seven goals out of nowhere Uh, yeah and he was a guy that was in the he's been a career minor leaguer so the fact that he's not only per, like not only is he not a negative impact on this team uh, most of the time he's he's scoring goals sometimes like he's he's got seven goals the guy that they gave the the lifetime contract to in Barkley Gujo scored his second goal of the year in a short-handed goal somehow against the Arizona Coyotes and they're paying him a lot more than the, what they're paying Johnny Brzezinski and Brzezinski has got seven goals so overall this is a team that's got a lot of talent and it's it's not untapped this is a team that's got a lot of talent and they are using it and they are exceeding expectations and that really is one of the biggest bright spots and has me excited for the playoffs i don't want to you know i don't want to get too excited i don't because we've been out there before with this team i don't want to jinx anything i don't you know i don't want to say anything out of line here but this 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 team has a has a great vibe around it they're, a lot of their players are, are playing well to this point, and, and now it's just a matter of having everybody healthy, bubble wrap the people that that need that need to be bubble wrapped if need be. Just uh, does it like these games? Sure, you want the president's trophy, you want the top spot in the Eastern Conference. That's all great. That all comes secondary to making sure everybody's healthy. Game one, just get there. Just get there. Pittsburgh, New Jersey, Detroit, Montreal, the Islanders, the Flyers, the Islanders, the Senators. Of these final games, there's only one team of those that's currently in a playoff spot. That's the Flyers. Not a particularly good team. Some of the Rangers have handled. They, they've won the first two against Philly. The Devils, Pittsburgh, dead bodies at this point. Their seasons are over. They have nothing to play for. Detroit is mathematically still alive, but hasn't played good hockey in probably close to a month at this point. The Islanders, they're dead. I know mathematically they're still alive, but they have not put together two consistent games in a row since they won six in a row. This is a very niche meme, but for like this is for the second wild card spot of like that very old SpongeBob episode where uh, SpongeBob's at like at the beach and he's and he's he has like an ice cream cone or something like that, and the he's like, oh, you can have it. Yeah, it's like. That's give it to him, SpongeBob. Give it to him. Yeah, like, oh yeah, you can have it. It's like this is what's going on in the second wild card spot. Like, nobody wants it. No. Everyone's losing. Everyone is 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 fumbling at the one yard line for this final wild card spot. I don't know what's happening. Detroit stinks. Washington stinks. Everybody below them stinks, and nobody wants this wild card spot. Somebody's gotta take it. Somebody. It's preposterous that two of Wa- that Washington and Philadelphia might both make the playoffs, and this is in an environment where the commissioner's talking about adding two more teams, and the, all of the insiders keep trying to do well. The NHL should be like the NBA; there should be a play-in. You could not, on no planet, should there 
anyone on this planet be subjected to watching the Red Wings play the Sabres to try and get into the playoffs. That would be horrendous. I understand the idea. It would be fun, though. No, it wouldn't. That would be be horrendous hockey. You want to watch Patrick Kane cherry pick against Tage Thompson on one leg? That sounds horrendous. The play-in in basketball has a little more juice because, as you said, one or two guys in basketball can swing a game because of how few guys are involved. Hockey, it's a lot harder for one guy to stand out and make something happen. But yeah, they've got one, two, three, four. They got eight games to go. The playoffs are going to start the 20th, according to Pierre Lebrun. We don't know if the Rangers are going to be on day A or day B, so they might not start till the 21st instead of the 20th. But you got to have a good feeling right now. Yeah. If they can round out these final eight games, they win six out of eight beat up on these bad teams, give the Islanders one last loss, beat the Devils one more time just for good measure to really make sure that body's dead, poke it with a stick just to be sure. That would be a really good feeling going into the playoffs. Not like last year where a lot of us had that nervous apprehension of, oh God, they're going to play the Devils in the first round because they played that game at the end of March against the Devils last year where the Devils stomped them, where the Devils won, I want to say, 7-3, to 7-4, to four, something like that. And that was just the lingering taste in everybody's mouth. This is an opportunity to solidify your issues, beat up on bad teams. You get to give Patrick Kane one last middle finger if you body the bag the Red Wings too. This is a really special group that has the potential to do what we need them to do. It is ultimately upon those individuals. If you are the superstitious type, by all means, wear your favorite pajamas or the certain jersey or the t-shirt, whatever it is. Make sure they have the Rangers logo on it. Like whatever floats your boat. Just do the just do the Tavares. Just you know, right team on it this time. Yes, whatever floats your boat. If you're the superstitious type, um, that'll just about do it for this week's episode of the Liberty Blue Podcast. Make sure you are subscribed wherever you get your podcasts. Leave the show a five-star review. If you are watching over on YouTube, hit that like button for the video. Hit the subscribe button. Subscribe to the channel. We're over 340 subscribers now. The community is hungry for good Rangers content like we are all hungry for a Rangers Stanley Cup. We'll talk.